Good evening, everybody. It's evening. Well, I'm a microbiologist. All of you know that, I'm sure. Let me take you to where it all started. I was seven years old, not 10 years old. I was seven years old, and I was, I confess, I was a naughty boy. <laughs> My mom had a friend. And that friend, you know, being a seven-year-old, I wouldn't want my mom to go away from me. And that friend came over and stayed for hours at our house. But that friend had, had a very, very strange habit. Whenever anybody shook hands with her, she would put her hands in the purse, move her hands, and you would smell the smell of alcohol. Well, we kids noticed these things. And we were five at the house, my cousins, my brother, and I. And we thought, well, when she comes next time, we're going to go in one by one. And let's see what happens. And this is exactly what happened. You know? We agreed that the when she finishes her, her ritual of, of you know, cleaning her hands, the last person who entered would cough, and the one after that would go in. <laughs> and this is exactly what happened. And one, two, three, I was number four. When I went in, well, I noticed that she was changing in color. I noticed that when I shook hands, she was struggling. Her hands were struggling to find probably a drop of alcohol in that bottle that she had there. And when I coughed and my brother came in, she suddenly rose up, stood up, and remembered she had a doctor's appointment, left without shaking hands with anybody, and we never saw that lady again in our <laughs> well, In that particular day, I felt that the scientist in me was bored because <laughs> I went there and I asked my mom, why, why did she put alcohol in, in her, uh, uh, I mean, she just, just put her hands in the purse and you could smell the alcohol, it was strong alcohol. Well, my mom said then that she was afraid that microbes would come from her hands, from our hands to her, and she was obsessed about that. Well, I have to admit, now we know that, yes, true, the best, the most important, the worst way in which you can get an, a disease agent is from the hands. And yes, we have to clean hands uh, regularly. Anyway, you know, when, when the issue of microbes started to come up, yes, I got so much interested in the issue, and I started to read on my own. I was seven years old, but then I started reading when I was in scouts, when I wanted to present anything, I would talk about a microbe or a disease. When I was at school, same thing. I graduated in the experimental science. I went into biology, and then, thank God, I got the acceptance to, uh, as a graduate student in the microbiology program in the School of Medicine. That was you know, a dream come true. I finished my master's degree, I started my PhD, and then another incident happened. A very important incident that I think is related to what we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> and this is, the, I was the graduate assistant to the chief of staff in the hospital who was an infectious disease specialist, Dr. Marwan Awaida, God bless his soul. And he was the infection control committee uh, chair. And the Infection Control Committee chair usually takes care of something strange, infections that are strange enough that happen in a hospital. And he was called upon to investigate a case of people dying after open heart surgery. And well, he took his graduate assistant, me, and we went there and investigated the case. And yes, it was a bacterial infection, but the bacteria grew very, very slowly, and probably the lab grew it. But they did not in any way consider that as the organism that caused the disease because we carry that organism on our body surfaces in many places in our body. So they thought it was a contamination and discarded it while actually it was the cause of the infection. You know, that strange uh, incident instigated me to think, why, did the, I mean, finding the organism was the answer to uh, what was happening in the hospital. But what made that organism so aggressive? It's living on us every single minute. What made it so strong? What made it so pathogenic in, in scientific language? Well, I graduated, and then I still had that question in mind. So I sent these organisms to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, which is, as you know, one of the recognized centers of the world. And this is, you know, when I got the biggest surprise. Dr. Nawaz, you are invited to come as a guest researcher in CDC. Wow. 
That was very big. And I did go there, and we found out that these organisms were actually new bacteria. They belonged to that same group of the bacteria that live on us, but they were new bacteria. And we characterized them, we published the information, but up till then, we did not get the answer. Why had they become so aggressive? You know, I came back, I worked for many years, I was in charge of a hospital a laboratory. So many strange cases over time, and then I came to LAU. And I started teaching microbiology, and then the second passion in my life, to serve the youth. I was appointed dean of students for 12 years, but then I never wanted to take the job without continuing in the same passion that I had, teaching microbiology. And I always taught microbiology. And in whatever scarce free time I had, I wanted to read about what's happening in the field. And this is when I started reading what Dr. Bonnie Basler from Stanford University was starting to publish with her team. She said that, well, there is a cell-to-cell -cell communication between bacteria. Bacteria usually communicate. And she, you know, with her team, found out that bacteria can produce a certain chemical. And they understood that chemical. It was their own language. And by understanding the amount of that chemical, they could know how many bacteria were in a particular area. And actually, they talked of the concentration of that chemical. They called it a language, and they called it, actually, an auto-inducer. And when, when that auto-inducer was in a certain concentration, then it gave the signal to the bacteria that you are now in a good number, and you can do whatever you want to do. So what we had is a unicellular organism, but then it was acting as if it was a multicellular organism. So all the bacteria in a group were starting to act as if they are one single team working together. So that red thing is the auto-inducer, the chemical that it produces. And whenever the amount of that chemical increased, the bacteria you know, would more or less know that now we are in a certain number and we are ready. But ready for what? You know, <clears throat> every time I teach my students microbiology, I tell them, well, the first step of any infection is usually attachment. They have to attach. And actually, this is what happens. So the bacteria come and attach themselves, and they form something that is known as a biofilm. And actually, this happens every day with us. Bacteria come over our skin, over our teeth, everywhere. And in that particular moment, this is number one here, this is the, when they first attach. And this is in numbers one and two, it is easy to remove them. That's why when we wash our hands, when we brush our teeth, whatever, we can easily remove them. We can take them away. However, when they start accumulating, like in three and in four, now things start to happen. They have reached quorum. And when we say quorum, yani they have reached the concentration that they think they are now, now ready to do something, and that something might be an attack. So at the end here, we find out that the bacteria that are released from that particular biofilm are not the same bacteria that existed in the beginning. They have something that has changed. Some characteristic had made them more and more uh, different from the original. Now, when we looked at the two major groups of bacteria, the gram-positive and the gram-negative bacteria, which cover almost all the spectrum of bacteria, we found out that, yes, the gram-positive bacteria produce variants of a certain chemical, and the gram-negative bacteria produce a va variants of, a of another chemical. And if we just look at the structure here, although it's a chemical structure, they, we see as if they are more or less similar with differences. But then if we look at the names of the organisms, we see that there are different bacteria there, here in gram-negative organisms, here in gram-positive organisms, which this simply means that we have, for every single species of bacteria, they have their own language. They understand each other. They know each other. They can communicate with each other. But none can communicate here by using these same chemicals with the other group. So they were understanding what's happening. They were communicating. And they were deciding on what to do with us. So what happens usually is the following. The amount of that autoinducer, that chemical, increases. And when it increases up to a certain limit, when quorum is reached, then that chemical, 
would come over and enter into the cell and lead to some change in the DNA. And this happens in both the gram-positive as well as the gram-negative bacteria. So there is a change in the genes, and that change that has happened there will let them be totally different. They will act together to do so many different things. And amongst these things is a genetic change, uh, having newer characteristics, and amongst these newer characteristics were being more toxic. They can produce toxins, they become more virulent, more causative of disease, and now that big question that was there is starting to get its answers. So now we know that in quorum sensing, the bacteria communicate and they are capable of really causing damage. Now, this is the whole story again. One organism, many organisms reaching quorum and leading to the change. But the, I, the, the uh, strange thing that happened later on was that a harmless organism now has become extremely aggressive because of that change that has happened. And of course, this explained the issue of those bacteria that they found in the hearts of the people who died from an organism that usually is not an organism that is deadly. Now, the bigger surprise was that bacteria are multilingual. Although each had their own language, yet they all produced another autoinducer, another chemical that they called autoinducer 2, and that makes them communicate with other types of bacteria. And this is bad, you know, we have a communication problem, bacteria don't. So they are capable of communicating very well, even with different groups now. The autoinducer 2 is produced by all bacteria and all understand that language. And so what might happen is that that biofilm that started to form from one organism might produce autoinducer two, and we end up by having organisms that originally may have not attached. But then because of the presence of that biofilm and because of the communication between the bacteria, it has joined in and now we have a very pathogenic population there. So that biofilm has now become extremely harmful for us. Okay, so we thought, what should we do? Should we stop the biofilm formation? Should we stop the autoinducers? Should we stop these chemicals from reaching each other? What can we do? And then we decided as scientists, let's try to understand what, what's happening there. Let's try to listen to what the bacteria are saying to each other. And yes, we understood so many things. We knew already that they would cooperate. They would cooperate, but then, Bacteria found out that there were cheaters amongst those uh, in the biofilm. Some of them just wanted to take advantage without giving their own autoinducer. But these were caught and the counter-cheating process started. Not only that, it was also noticed that sometimes relationships go bad <laughs> between bacteria. And this is when they fight each other. They compete, they destroy each other, and then when we looked closely at what's happening there, we noticed that some bacteria can, one, produce chemicals that can stop the production of the autoinducer, so they're numb. Two, the bacteria can produce certain chemicals that resemble the first autoinducer to block the receptors and lead to no change. Three, they can produce certain chemicals that would break the autoinducer, the language of other bacteria. And four, they even can, believe me, they even can let, oblige the other bacteria to commit suicide. And this happens. So by listening to the bacteria, by understanding what they're saying, we reached a lot of conclusions. And I'm happy to say that many scientists are working on that, and our team are, is working on that. And we hope that by communicating, communicating with all scientists around the world, hoping with proper communication of, of everybody, we can stop the communication of bacteria. Thank you.